Oh, Jesus Christ. Hello, welcome to another video, and, ooh, oof, jeez, this channel hasn't seen the best of days, has it? Well, I'm sorry everyone, things kind of just caught up with me in my regular life, and unfortunately I just didn't have time to work on proper videos for a while. I've really let it just kind of rust into disrepair, and now here we are, with a channel that doesn't get any uploads, and a guy who has a hard time actually making videos. But I kind of want to change that around. This video is going to be the first of many that I have coming down the pipeline, so don't worry about that. So stay tuned for more. In the meantime, let's pretend that I haven't been gone for a year, as hilarious as that sounds. Let's look at a game called Abuse. Abuse is a 2D run-and-gun side-scroller developed by a studio called Crack.com and released in 1996. It was also initially sold as shareware for Windows and Linux, and then eventually it was ported over to Mac OS by Bungie. Yeah, that Bungie. Huh. Anyways, there's quite a bit to talk about, but we don't have much time. Let's jump right into this. You play as Nick Vrenna, who has been wrongfully incarcerated in a prison that performs unethical experimentation on the inmates. Also, they must have been doing some hardcore experimentation. It takes effort to turn a human being into a xenomorph. However, surprise surprise, a riot occurs, the experiments go wrong, and everything goes to shit. Nick is somehow immune to all of this, he breaks free, arms himself to the teeth, and has to escape the prison, all the while dealing with hordes of monsters and robots. Abuse. So pretty basic plot, just a starter to push the action forward. So this is a 90s era DOS game, non-existent plot, and a rocking atmosphere. However, there is one thing that stands out to me the second I first start playing this game. The gameplay. More specifically, the controls. It's pretty great? I can admit, I've never been too fond of most side-scrolling running guns from the 80s and 90s, especially on the NES or SNES, and it boils down to the controls. Nintendo was pretty much the leader when it came to gaming standards, and their controllers were no exception. It always boiled down to a D-pad for movement and a couple buttons for running, jumping, sprinting. Now this works okay for 2D platformers. You only need four directions for movement, a button for jumping, and then another button for whatever else you need. Side-scrolling run-in guns are trickier, because they need to wrestle with both 2D platforming and shooting. So what you usually get is this ugly compromise where the player can only shoot where they're moving. I'm sure the devs would have loved to have more options for controls, but again, it was just the standard. No one knew any differently. Anyways, I am a zoomer. I grew up in the futuristic age of 3D gaming, and let me tell you, I have a hard time getting used to these controls. I love going back and playing older games, but side-scroller running guns like this? It takes effort just to play them. It feels like I'm playing as a fucking shark with a gun strapped to my head. I gotta keep moving forward and hope that any enemy that approaches me does so within these small, narrow sightlines. But Abuse. Abuse was not a console game. No, no, no. This game was exclusive to MS-DOS, Mac OS, and even the Amiga. No D-pad, no AB buttons, nope. Abuse had the greatest gift ever bestowed onto the gaming industry. A keyboard and mouse. That's right. Despite my attitude towards 2D run-in guns at the time, I've gotta say, the controls are kinda fantastic. Keyboard movement and the mouse aims. Shit. That's perfect for me. For a lot of PC games before 96, the mouse was almost never used, with the only exception I can think of being adventure or strategy games. And some simulation games? Older titles almost always stuck with the keyboard, and that was pretty much it. Even when 3D games were popping up, such as Wolfenstein and Doom, a lot of these games stuck with keyboard aiming. However, when Quake came out, keyboard and mouse aiming became the standard. That game had way too much verticality to allow for keyboard aiming. You needed a mouse just to look up and down. And Abuse is lucky because it was an early adopter of this control scheme. God damn, this game feels great to play, even 25 years later. I mentioned earlier that a lot of people compare this game to Doom or Quake. Well, this is definitely the reason why. The game takes on a completely different feel. And all of a sudden, you no longer feel like you're playing a Nintendo game. You feel like you're playing a PC shooter. I really can't understate the benefits of simply having a mouse to aim. 
you can shoot just about any angle, not to mention the fact that you can also shoot running backwards. This is pretty important to abuse, as it's a core feature of what you'll be doing a lot. All of a sudden, you aren't restricted to these narrow lines of sight that you need to force enemies into, just to kill them. Now it's completely opened up, and in a way, it kind of helps with frustration. Because instead of being able to blame your inability to kill a bad guy on the game itself, it's entirely your fault. You have the agency to kill bad guys, which feels really good. So I've talked a lot about the controls, but these controls exist for a reason. They needed to accommodate Abuse's intense combat. Let's dive further into that. Abuse has six weapons. The very first weapon in the game is a rapid-fire laser gun that is pretty decent against early enemies, but it chews through ammo. The next weapon you get your hands on is a rapid-fire grenade launcher, which is actually pretty good. I always see this as a good fallback weapon, where you don't really have ammo for any other weapons, this is a good thing to clear your path. However, it is hard to use on certain enemies due to the fact that its projectiles have a pretty short arc, so use it sparingly. There's a rocket launcher that can lock onto enemies, and it's a pretty good tool for long-range monsters. However, the lock-on feature can be very annoying. You might be trying to aim at one monster, but that rocket is locked onto a completely different one. You got the plasma gun. It's essentially a much better version of the laser gun, with more damage, but even less ammo. The flamethrower, or napalm launcher, or whatever this thing is called, this is the game's equivalent of the BFG. It spews this amazing huge fountain of fire that can insta-kill most enemies. Ammo for it is extremely rare though, and it's definitely the gun you want to save for a rainy day. This thing can evaporate swarms of monsters like they're nothing, and I can't tell you how many moments there are in this game that you want to save it for. Actually, I'll tell you right now. Okay, look at this. This is a section in the game where you need to run past this massive horde of monsters. Meanwhile, there is literally a ticking clock, and a bomb is going to blow up in a matter of seconds, killing you and everything here instantly. So all you got to do is run through here, jump up here, jump up here, get to the elevator, and you're safe. But remember, you have to get through all of these enemies while a fucking timer counts down to your doom. When I first played this section, I struggled to get through it over and over and over. I mean, you can't just sprint past them because they maul you to death instantly. But at the same time, you can't just slowly whittle them down from a distance because the bomb will go off and kill you. Yeah, it's kind of impossible, but like most problems in life, it can be easily solved with a flamethrower. Keep in mind, I only have a handful of shots left. I don't think I've ever had more than 10 pieces of ammo for this weapon. I could easily have wasted it in an earlier section. There's no guarantee that I would have saved it up by this point. However, after replaying this game, I stored it up just for this moment. Wow, look at that. All of a sudden, it's a piece of cake. In the game's defense, there aren't too many of these sections, but they do crop up every now and then. Trust me, I'll talk about this game's difficulty later. Anyway, there's this gun, which kind of fires a laser, but the last gun is super devastating. Kind of a rocket launcher, but instead of a rocket, it fires this slow-moving particle that just creates this huge explosion radius. A good weapon to take out a large group of enemies. In this part of the game, the gunplay and the ammo and all of those mechanics really ties it close to games like Doom, Quake, Duke 3D, as opposed to other side-scrollers. Because honestly, the strategies that you use for those FPS games are pretty compatible with abuse. You gotta constantly search and hoard for ammo, look for secret med kits and more ammo reserves, and keep track of what weapons are the right tool for the right job. It's a very similar style of play that I kind of experience when I play Doom. It feels like 2D Doom. Also, throughout some levels, you can equip certain upgrades that are removed by the level's end. For example, one upgrade is a pair of mechanical legs that let you run faster. This particular upgrade is a little odd as I can't find a definitive use for it other than speedrunning to the end of the level as fast as you can. Another upgrade that you get is this jetpack. Now this thing is utilized well. The levels that feature this upgrade always have a nice big room where you can fly up to the ceiling, tons of verticality. It's great stuff, honestly. Of course, the gameplay means nothing without any enemy to shoot at, and Abuse has plenty of stuff that wants to kill you. You have automated turrets, grenade launching robots, flying drones, giant bouncing spike balls, giant drills, the mutants. What's weird is I can't tell what enemies have AI and which ones don't. Like, okay, the mutants, they have AI. Matter of fact, it's actually pretty good. 
They can jump over obstacles, jump up platforms, climb on the ceiling, and they just generally pursue you for a pretty far distance. Honestly, these moments of the game make you feel like you're playing some aliens game. I mean, come on. You can't look at these things and tell me this isn't just a xenomorph painted a certain color. So the mutants are pretty smart, but I can't say the same for the other enemies. The drones definitely have AI. They mindlessly pursue you. However, these big walking robots, I think don't have any AI? Like, okay, they launch grenades at you, they walk forward slowly, but that's kind of it? Their grenade arc is predetermined, meaning that you can literally hide under the arc of their grenade. They won't adjust it. All they seem to do is just kind of slowly walk forward and shoot at you. And when they encounter a ledge, they just kind of stop. And if you get to an angle that they can't shoot you at, you can just kill them without them reacting. I'm kind of convinced that these guys are brain dead. Actually, I'm reminded of that old robot toy that a lot of 2000s kids may remember. You know, the Robo Sapien toy, where you can have it walk forward, but it would just kind of completely ignore anything in front of it. That's what these guys remind me of. Anyway, we talked about gameplay, but how are the levels themselves? Well, ugh, dang it. Alright, that's where things get a little interesting. The level design is, best I can say, interesting, but definitely teeters on frustrating. First thing to get out of the way, this is not a Metroidvania game. With the dark atmosphere, the graphics, and even my arguably unfair comparisons to 2D Nintendo games, you might infer that, but nope, this is a linear side-scroller. Instead, the level design feels similar to something you'd see in, I'd say, Quake. Levels do seem a little complicated on paper, however, there's a lot of looping back, some secrets, a lot of backtracking, but it's never maze-like. Like in Quake, you can follow a single path all the way through and never get lost. This game kind of reminds me of that, but the levels, they're... Ah, you know what? I'm in such a good mood. Let's focus on something better. The music. And Abuse's soundtrack is pretty good, I gotta say. The tracks are a little moody, but not to the levels of, you know, Quake. Instead, you get some pretty kicking tunes and melodies, some of which will unironically be stuck in your head, given how multiple levels reuse the same track. Instead, you got some pretty kicking tunes and melodies. But be warned, some of these tracks will get stuck in your head. This is one of those games where once a track is done, it just loops it right over again, and it'll play it endlessly. Even when you load a save game, the soundtrack starts right back up again, so you're going to recognize the beginning of every single music track in this game by the time it's over. You are not getting this out of your head. But yeah, it's pretty good stuff. Good old 90s MIDI. I also noticed that Abuse tends to get compared to Quake for its visuals, and it's a pretty fair comparison. You have a very muted color palette, brown, gray, dull bronze, metal, a little bit of HR Geiger thrown in there for good measure. Overall, it's kind of creepy and dark. I'm honestly conflicted about the graphics. On one hand, the sprite works amazing. There is a clear amount of effort that went into this, especially the player sprite. I kind of love how much detail this guy has, adding in all those animations depending on where he's looking, his running animations, he has a good momentum to him. I don't know how to describe it. It just kind of looks really cool. However, the lack of any color really adds to the monotony of this game. And it also ends up making all the levels sort of blend together. Commander Keen is a great example of a 2D PC game with excellent sprite work and a colorful art style. God, the color in Commander Keen just pops whenever you play it. It's very memorable, visually appealing, and that's good enough for me. But here, yeah, it's just kind of murky. That's also how I'd sum up Abuse's graphics. It's pretty good, but just a little dull compared to what else was out on the market. All right, we need to talk about frame rate. Frame rate is a bit like Pandora's box, where ignorance of it definitely leaves you better off. Understanding and being hyper aware of frame rate can sometimes feel like a curse. For example, I made the eternal mistake of getting a 144Hz monitor. Now I can literally see when frames drop down to 60. Down to 60. Ugh. Oh, please kill me. Low frame rates are already bad enough, especially for old games. I've seen some games that have you run it at 45, other games you have to run at 30. Well, Abuse, you have to run it at 15. I guess some people are more acclimated to this, but to me, this is right around the threshold between a regular moving video and a slideshow. And another pet peeve of mine, all of the game's functions are tied directly to frame rate. So even if you try to run the game at a higher frame rate, that just turns the game into a fucking inconceivable mess. Oh yeah, this is perfectly fine. 
You would think that by 96, the developers should have known better. 60 FPS was already becoming the standard. Hell, 70 FPS was already possible thanks to VGA. But for 90s PC games, nothing was standardized. Hell, even now I still run into games who have their game engine tied directly to the frame rate. So until someone quite literally just remakes this game in a new, completely different engine, abuse will never run higher than 15. And again, you can force the game to run higher, but I highly, highly recommend against it. If you want to feel like you're playing this game on speed, go right ahead. Crack.com. Damn straight. I should also specify, I'm playing a source port of this game. That's right. This game isn't just open source, it's abandonware, but it also might be freeware. I'm still not sure about that. Remember how I mentioned that Abuse came out in 1996? Well, to give a little history lesson, 1996 was one of the biggest fucking years for PC games. In that year alone, we had Descent 2, Command & Conquer, Civ 2, Daggerfall, Duke Nukem 3D, and Quake. Jesus Christ. Abuse only managed to sell 80,000 units total. It was a small fish in a big, big ocean. And Crack.com must have felt this somewhere along the way as two years later, they released the source code, then promptly went out of business for good. Since then, Abuse has become freeware, with source ports coming out for pretty much every system you can think of. And I don't just mean various OS's like modern Windows, modern Linux, modern Mac OS. No, this game was literally ported to the iPhone, to the Wii? Yeah, the Wii. Someone ported this game so that you could play it with a fucking Wiimote. Jesus Christ. This specific port that I'm playing right now was released five years ago for the game's 20th anniversary. And honestly, this is the definitive way to play this game. It adds modern Windows support, OpenGL rendering, and a bunch of other configuration settings like resolution, frame rate, control schemes, even gamepad support. Which, eh, I mean, this game plays best on a mouse and keyboard. I don't know how anyone would be able to beat this game with a controller. Honestly, Abuse is the prime example of why releasing a game's source code can do wonders to its longevity. It was a forgotten cult classic back in the 90s, but now, thanks to programmers and nerds on the internet, all doing it for free by the way, this game can literally run on anything you can throw at it. And it's all entirely free to download. I mentioned that I thought it was abandonware earlier, but it's pretty much freeware. You can download this game anywhere you'd like. It's free, nobody's stopping you. You'd normally expect a game that's abandoned where to just kind of disappear and fade into obscurity, but if you give it enough community support, make it open source, any community, no matter how small, can keep the ball rolling for years into the future. This game is still being downloaded and played, likely for the first time by many new people. This goes to show just how tiny cult classics like Abuse can survive for such a long time. Who knows, maybe people are just drawn to this game's natural difficulty. Because it is challenging. It is... okay. Ugh, damn it. Alright, there's no getting around it. This game is hard. That in itself shouldn't be surprising, as most 90s PC games were just hard. But Abuse, it's something else. The best way I can describe it is that when playing Abuse, you feel like you're fighting not the enemies, but the developers themselves, if that makes sense. Games vary as to how benevolent the developer is. Easier and more casual games make you feel like the developer is on your side, like you're a little toddler, and the developer is dangling a key in front of your face, helping you along the way, making sure you never fail. Personally, I prefer games where it doesn't feel like the developer is breathing down your neck. Rather, they're just kind of observing you from afar, giving you opportunities to succeed and beat the game, but if you're an idiot and make dumb decisions, then they have no interest in stopping you. Every now and then, though, you stumble upon a game where you can immediately tell that the developers are out for blood. Games whose enemy design was made purely for the player to get frustrated at. Games that might have cheap traps just for the player to lose health on. Level design intentionally made to screw the player over at certain sections. It doesn't feel like the devs want to create a challenge anymore. Instead, it feels like the developers want to kill you. A weird side effect of this type of game design is that you start getting into the minds of the developers themselves. No longer worried about the game itself, but instead you're trying to outthink the masterminds behind the scenes. 
Imagine for a sec you're back in college. For those of you who are in college, this should be pretty easy. Now try and remember a time where you had to take a quiz or write an essay for an English class or some equivalent course. Like a course that had less to do with science or math and something more subjective. In an English course, when you're writing about some old book or essay, you aren't just trying to write what you think the correct answer is. You're trying to write what you think the professor thinks the correct answer is, which is very different. This is what it feels like to play abuse. I'm not playing logically anymore. I'm playing to outplay the developers. So what happens is that you essentially turn into a damn maniac, constantly playing a mental game of chess each time you enter a new room. Levels are designed in such a way to never, ever make you feel safe. Now, usually, in a game like Doom or Duke 3D, you'd have a few moments of quiet time. Segments to catch your breath, maybe involving some light puzzles or backtracking, stuff like that. You'd have these breaks between the chaotic action to get your bearings and to essentially get hyped for the next round of mayhem. But in abuse, these moments are few and far between and mostly non-existent. Just about any time you have to yourself in this game, you know that in the back of your mind, devs are just waiting for you to pass a trigger point and spawn a shitload of mutants right on top of you. They're waiting for you to fall into a false sense of security. And my god, these moments keep you on edge the entire way through. You'll have scenarios where you step into an unsuspecting room, but like the maniac that you are, you just know that there is something waiting for you around the corner. You know that there is a trap somewhere in here that once you spring, a million mutants are going to spawn and swarm at you. And holy shit, that mutant spawn sound effect? Can we hear it one more time? Holy fuck. It's just this one screeching sound layered almost a dozen times on top of each other at full volume. It is the stuff of nightmares. This is the sound I'm going to hear on my deathbed. This game is not forgiving. Yeah, it's pretty much trial and error for a lot of these rooms. Like, yeah, I should have known that a horde of monsters would just pop in behind me. Or, yeah, I should have known that entering this room was a terrible idea. Or, yeah, I should have known that a bunch of spike balls would spawn in and try to crush me like I'm in a fucking pinball machine. Another interesting part of the game's design is the save system. Basically, this game has designated save points. No quick saves allowed. I would compare this system to that of Metroid, but honestly that's not a fair analogy. With Metroid, you're progressing through a large map, constantly backtracking and revisiting rooms and areas. The save points are essentially checkpoints, little breaks between long treks and journeys that you'll be revisiting very regularly. Not an abuse. This is a linear game. So these save points end up resembling something like a horror game. I kept thinking of Alien Isolation or Resident Evil as I played this. Oh god. Oh god. I need a save station. Oh god, please, don't let me die, don't let me die. Okay, there's gotta be one right around the corner, right? Oh, there it is, there it is, great, whew, I'm alive, I'm alive. Oh, that's another thing. This game should have a warning whenever you play it. You know how some games have warnings for people with epilepsy, where they shouldn't play this game if they're susceptible to having seizures with flashing lights? Well, Abuse should have a similar warning message telling you not to play this game if you're a paranoid schizophrenic. Schizophrenics have a hard time as it is, dealing with government-hired gang stalkers and aliens that like to move their car keys around their room in the middle of the night. But Abuse is a game that could seriously cause mental problems with that particular demographic. I'm not kidding. This game made me feel like a schizo myself, where everything around me was waiting for me to turn my back just so they could kill me. I can only imagine what it would do to an actual schizophrenic. Abuse truly lives up to its name. It's hard to marathon this game in one sitting because you feel exhausted when you make it through a single level. Like you've just run a near impossible gauntlet that you're fairly sure you can never successfully beat a second time. But that is the entire game. Gah. Alright, let's try to beat this thing. Come on, come on, don't let me die, don't let me die. Whew, made it. Oh sweet, we actually get an ending. You've survived impossible odds and made it to the control room. By pulling the switch, you have diverted the water supply and stopped the spread of abuse. Congratulations, you're howling. Abuse! That's the game. Pretty standard for a PC game of the time. Non-existent story, very intense combat, very difficult gameplay. That's all I really have to say about it. It's abuse. Not really a horror game, just kind of an action side-scroller with some moody ambience and visuals. I used to regularly revisit this game time and time again, but I never really progressed that far into it. Now I see why. 
It's a staple of difficult 90s gaming where devs were just trying to kill you. All right, my final words on this game. The best action in a side-scroller? I put a question mark at the end of this because I don't definitively know. There may be a 2D game out there that matches its combat, but if so, I haven't found it. Abuse certainly has the best combat of the 2D side-scrollers I have played, but I'm certainly not an expert. I'm an FPS fan, pure and simple. And to me, the 2D genre is a little hard to get into. So it should mean a lot when I say that this game, by far, had amazing gameplay. The game itself had problems, but the combat was not one of them. In desperate need of a re-release or remake. I feel like Abuse will have a much longer lifespan if it received a major facelift tech-wise. I'm not even talking about updated graphics, rather I just want a better frame rate. However, I feel like Abuse's frame rate being tied to the game speed stems from the engine that it was coded on. A proper re-release on a different engine, probably from the ground up, can make for a better version of the game. I want to see Abuse running at HD at an uncapped frame rate, but meh. This game is freeware. No publisher wants to touch it, so the only hope we have at seeing any kind of a remake would be from a fan remake or another source port. I guess it's probably a pipe dream. And my final word on this game. This game makes me feel like a schizophrenic. I've gotta give it credit, not a lot of games manage to pull this off. The developers over at Crack.com love to torture the player whenever they can, and you are going to spend the entire game constantly second-guessing what you do and what they have in store for you. I feel that the Saw movies are a pretty good analogy for this game. You only exist to suffer for the amusement of those that created this hell. This game manages to make you never feel safe. There are no reprieves, no breaks or pauses. Instead, it's full madness from start to finish. By the end of the game, you are paranoid about a swarm of monsters spawning in around the next corner or falling into some unforeseen trap. Man, surely this hallway leads into a trap. But wait, maybe that's what the devs want me to think, and they're actually subverting my expectations by placing the trap somewhere else. No, wait, what if the devs know I'm second-guessing their trap placement, and they know that I'll think it's too obvious to put a trap there, and so in reality, they did put a trap there, and they're expecting me not to- th ah!